Hi, uh, I'm Carly Exigan. I'm Jake Luciani. We're from uh, Blue Mountain Capital, and we're here today to talk about financial time series and um, how we've stored them using Cassandra 1.2. So uh, the first thing, you know, you need to know your problem. So right now, we have thousands of, of consumers. Uh, they ask data. They want to consume the data as quickly as possible. They want to write the data as quickly as possible. So you know, they want consistent reads. They want to be able to handle ad hoc user queries quickly. And, and we do have multiple data centers. All right, so the data that we store is financial time series data. So this can be tick level data. It can be uh, data that the traders actually put in. So it could be very sparse. Um, but it's, it's time series data. So it looks kind of like this. So you have a bunch of discrete points at, uh, at many intervals of time. And you want to be able to store both of these efficiently and you want to be able to query these efficiently. So what are the queries that our, our um, users ask us? There's a time series query, and there's a cross-section query. So the time series query is basically, here's a start, here's an end, here's a periodicity. And so between the start and the end, at certain intervals, I want data. So here, start is 10 AM and is 2 p.m., and we want it at every one minute. So the start, the end, and the periodicity defines the query. The other type of query is a cross-section. So I give a single point in time, and I want to know the data that's stored at that point in time. So in this one, there's two different, uh, two different data points, so the Microsoft and the Apple price. And we're asking for the data as of 11 AM. So the as of time is the only component to the query. So cross sections are for random data. We don't know ahead of time what all of the components of a cross section query are going to be. So if we optimize for the cross section, that means that we're storing thousands of writes. And we can get inconsistent queries across the writes. And we also need by temporality. So that basically means we have one time, which is when it happened, and one time when we found out about it. But it's hard, so we'll ignore it in the query. OK, so. And we have really demanding users. So you know, I mean, this is, uh, this is a system that we've been working on for six months. Um, we've dedicated a lot of resources to it. And so they want a lot out of the system. Uh, so we can't optimize for both cases. So let's optimize for the time series. Um, it's a really simple data model to go put into Cassandra. So this is how it gets stored. You know, this is Cassandra 1.1, how you would represent it. Basically, you have the, the ticker. You have the name, these two times and then the value. So Apple last price for two days ago as of yesterday, or when we, and we found out about yesterday. Uh, last price for yesterday we found out yesterday, and last price for today that we found out, or for yesterday that we found out today. So we're actually using Cassandra 1.2. So it gives us a bunch of improvements, like we, and we use all of these. So it gives us CQL3. It gives us the vnodes, JBOD, pool decompression buffers, SSD aware, parallel compaction, off heap bloom filters, metrics, and concurrent schema creation. So CQL3, it's a pretty simple, pretty simple uh, table. Um, I mean, it, it's a pretty simple mapping from the, the uh, data that we want to store to the CQL3 that we want to write. So here we have the, the ID, which we store as a binary, the property that would be last price. Uh, we store ticks because we have to represent dates somehow. And then we have uh, the value, which is just bytes. So this is 
the time series query that we want to write. Um, this doesn't even include periodicity, so it's just start and end, and give me all the data in between those. And then here's the cross section that we want to write. So given some as of point, give me the last knowledge time that we know. So we're getting way too much data back. We get every single point between the start and the end, even if there's you know, a million knowledge times. So we're rewriting the data a million times, and we only care about it every one minute, we would get all million points back, and we would filter it down to one. And we have the knowledge time as well. So we want to be able to, to know what we knew, uh, or we want to be able, we want to know the last point that we knew about. So we're building a service, not an app. So our users, they're running on a huge grid and their applications, and they're hammering us very quickly. So basically, they, they want to go as quickly as possible, and we're the limiting factor. So we have our service on top of Cassandra. So that Olympus is what does the, the filtering for us. So here's the type of filtration that we have to do. So we filter everything by knowledge time. We filter the time series queries by periodicity. So Cassandra gives us back a ton more data than we actually want to use. So we're filtering, right now we filter 200,000 points down to 300 that we actually return. So one thing that, that we've been discussing is push down filters. So basically, instead of having the the service layer do filtering, we would push that down into the Cassandra layer. So we, we do down samples on right. We also would do, um, uh, basically the periodicity would be done on the coordinator. So rather than having it go back to service to be done, the coordinator would be able to do it with its local uh, cache. And then the values that we're storing aren't all doubles. So storing, you know, we, we want to store a blob, uh, basically. So, and some values belong together. Sometimes we have some complex value that we want to store. So we use Thrift to do this. So Thrift gives us the typed extensible schema, and it gives us, the union types give us an easy way to deserialize. So this is an example of a, a Thrift union. So basically, the um, we have just like two ints and then getting it back in a double. So it can be one of those three, but it can't be all three. Um, so getting it back out in C sharp, which is what we use, is pretty easy because you always get back the type, a, a type that is exactly the type that you, ex that you put in. So it would be like a store type that volume. So if you're, if you're storing the volume data. All right, so now I'm going to turn it over to Jake. Thanks. Uh, but that was the easy part, right? So, you know, all this data modeling and customers, consumers. But the really hard part is, and I know it is, is using this. No, scaling. The really hard part is, you know, figuring out how, how, how is this going to support our, 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 uh, our business requirements. And, you know, the first rule of scaling that, you know, everyone always tries that never works is, I'm just going to make everything go as fast as possible by, by creating like the biggest uh, you know, uh, pr process, and I'm going to buy the biggest machines, and I'm going to buy the, you know, the, the, I'm going to set all the settings to you know, 200 trillion, and it, I'll never have a problem. Everything will scale. And that, that never really works. So the, the real key to, to scaling this type of system is, um, is you, know, we, you, have to, you have to think about uh, what is the right h hardware for this workload, um, how can we deal with, with the JVM, which ends up being 95% you know, of the uh, 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 unknowns. Because for every different workload, you're going to have all different types of, of uh, heap fragmentation and, and, and all sorts of uh, other problems that, uh, that, that, that you may not have on, uh, on, on, on other workloads. Uh, you know, so you have to think about, you know, how do I read this data? How do I write it? How frequently does it happen? And, and what are the typical queries that, that, uh, that, that I can uh, 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 tune for? Uh, the next thing is, uh, you know, you have to tune Cassandra for your workload. Uh, you know, Cassandra comes out of the box with, with, with some really sensible uh, defaults. 
but you know you can't really go to production with with, with those default settings because there's so many factors. Um, and Cassandra gives you you know the, the Cassandra.yaml and the uh, Cassandra dash m dot sh, there's a whole bunch of things in there that you should read about and, and understand and, and understand what the meaning of those are when it comes to uh, the impact on your system. Uh, and then finally, uh, this is sort of a, an outside thing, but this is what the, uh, what the Olympus service does, which is uh, to prefetch uh, and, 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 uh, and cache data uh, for our workload so that, so that we try to anticipate uh, uh, what the consumers are, are, are gonna ask for. Um, and this is obviously a lot easier for, uh, for us because you know, a lot of our systems are automated, uh, but, uh, but, but, but it definitely applies uh, to a lot of use cases. Um, whoops, I went back. Right, so uh, the first rule is uh, you can't fix what you can't measure. And what we do is uh, we, we use this great open source project called uh, 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 Riemann, uh, which if you guys haven't heard of it, you should definitely check it out. And, and what it allows you to do is sort of stream, uh, you can push uh, metrics in, in, uh, into Riemann, and it's basically a, uh, uh, a, a event processing system where you can build uh, uh, alerts, you can build a a aggregation, you can proxy off to systems like uh, gr 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 Graphite. Um, and you can build some really, uh, uh, you know, you can basically have it beep your cell phone when, you know, when basically, uh, when two nodes go down or something like that. Uh, so you can build all sorts of interesting uh, uh, alerts and dashboards uh, d just using uh, Riemann. We currently push about uh, 4,000 metrics uh, per second into Riemann. And what's cool about Riemann is um, you can actually use it straight with Cassandra 1.2. Uh, and this was on uh, the, the DataSax dev blog, which we shared famously stole, but, uh, but so Riemann uh, has a Java client, and if you drop that Java client into the uh, Cassandra lib directory, and you basically put um, this little jar file, if you compile this into a little jar file, and you tell the manifest, basically lo load this before Cassandra starts, then um, it basically sets up a Riemann reporter to take all of the, all of the one, two metrics, um, which basically tracks all of the uh, uh, Java beans um, and everything uh, else that's in, inside of Cassandra that's tracked. Um, and it pushes them out, out, out to Riemann. Uh, and What's cool about Riemann is you've got, kind of got two different views that you, can, that you kind of get right out of the box. The first is um, you, you, can, you can push metrics uh, uh, into this da uh, dashboard. You can build these sort of real-time dashboards of like what the, what the latest metric is, right? So you can build these, um, and it uses uh, web sockets, um, so, so, it, it, so it all runs in real time uh, in, in the browser. And you can configure these, these dashboards and save them down. Um, and you can track uh, and set up dashboards for, for all sorts of things. So you can see like what the current load is, like what the current everything is. And then at the same time, uh, Riemann will push everything off to uh, uh, Graphite uh, after it goes through the, uh, the, the uh, uh, streams. Uh, so so you, if you don't configure any streams, you can basically say, you know, any metric that, that has the word Cassandra in it, send to this Graphite server. And any, any metric that, that, you know, that has my app in it, send, send to this Graphite server, send it to both. Um, and as you can see in Graphite, you can sort of, uh, so having these two together, you can, you can answer two questions, like what's going on right now? You know, there's some giant query running, and you know, what's the current CPU? You know, I don't really care about what it looked like 10 minutes ago. I don't want to have to change that dashboard. I just want to know what's right now. And then when you know someone yells at you and they're like, "What happened?" Then you know, you have a quick place to go, and you can build these dashboards that that take basically any metric. Um, and I think I missed. Uh, and then one, one of the cool, other cool things about Riemann is the fact that it's push-based. You can you can kind of combine your Cassandra metrics with with your own application metrics. So, so Riemann uh, uses proto buffers. Uh, there's uh, we we wrote a C sharp driver. Um, there's Java drivers. There's drivers for every language um, uh, that, that 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 proto buffers. Uh, support and you can uh, basically write your own little application metrics. So if you're writing an application that like queries Cassandra, does something with it, and then you know uh, s s sends it back out, you can basically build a metric around that task as well, um, and and that gets pushed out alongside of it. So you can build your own dashboards in like one single integrated system, and it's really really valuable. It's it's helped us figure out a lot of uh, issues as we fit them. Uh, the other big tool I want to push is Visual VM. This is like I don't know how I didn't know about this being a Java developer, but uh, 
it's 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 a Sun tool that um, Sun comes comes with comes with this process called JSTAT D. Uh, and if you, if you start it up, you basically get all these real time metrics out of uh, out of this tool. So you can basically uh, connect to to any. Uh, Java process, and you can see things like if you look over on the right, you can actually see um, the, the real-time garbage collection uh, uh, stats as they're coming in. So you can see like uh, how uh, you, you can watch your uh, your e e e e e Eden fill up, um, and then you, you you can watch it get. Uh, pro, pro, uh, pro, Promoted, uh, and, and then you can watch the, the old gen fill up, and then you can watch all of the, the garbage collections happening. And it gives you a real like uh, the ability to kind of uh, tweak some uh, some garbage collection settings, watch what happens, uh, come back, and you don't necessarily have to have all of them locked out. So it's a really useful tool. You can also pr uh, pr profile the application live. Um, you can do all sorts of really co cool things, and and it has plugins built in. Highly recommended. Uh, so. Down to actual scaling. So those are kind of the tools that we use to kind of help figure out what's going on and how can we make it better. Uh, the next thing is, uh, you know, so, so for our machine setup, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're using uh, SSDs for, for all the hot data. Currently, you know, all of our data is hot, but over time, um, you know, as, year, as years goes on, we're going to be able to move data um, off, uh, off of SSD. Uh, you know, our JBOD uh, config, which means uh, just a bunch of disks, um, instead of having like a RAID 0, if you have RAID 0, uh, then basically if you lose one disk, then the whole node is gone. If you do like RAID 5, then you're losing, uh, you know, 30% of, 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 your, of your disk space. Um, JBOD is, is just the idea that you, know, you have a bunch of different mount points and you just randomly throw data into random drives. Um, so if one of those drives dies, um, then all the other drives are still working. And Cassandra 1.2 has this built in now. It works really well. It's actually helped us a bunch of times. We've lost um, uh, more than, I think, three or four drives at this point. And, uh, and uh, it's basically kept everything up and running. And we've only lost just a portion of the data. Uh, another thing I'll recommend is if you're using SSDs, you need as many cores as you can get your hands on uh, because uh, it's, it's very uh, c c CPU limited. Uh, so, you know, the, the I.O. falls away uh, because you have all these really fast seeks and all of a sudden the bottleneck becomes CPU. Uh, and Cassandra's built to run with a very high uh, con concurrency. Uh, the, the, the JVM does a great job with it. So I would definitely... Uh, you know, put as many cores as you can get. Uh, you know, 10, 10 gig network, bonded network cards, and jumbo frames, which is the idea that each TCP packet, um, you actually try to shove uh, as much information as you can into each packet. Uh, yeah, so JBOD's a lifesaver. I didn't, I actually wanted to put uh, some information in here. There's actually, um, from, from our hardware vendor, the, the, uh, there was a BIOS update uh, that we didn't know about ahead of time, but they pushed out a bio update and basically said, this fixes the problem when you do lots of sequential reads for a long period of time, uh, you know, you, you could end up losing the uh, drive, which is exactly what happens in a compaction, right? So we, so we, all of a sudden we were doing like compactions like, you know, over, over, over uh, a weekend, and all of a sudden these drives started failing. We were like, what is going on? Uh, so it, it turns out it was this, it was this bug, but, uh, but, but, but JBOD worked around it, um, so you know, it, uh, at least it got most of the way through. Uh, so we installed the BIOS update and then everything, uh, everything came back and it was working fine. Uh, the, the black magic of JVM, this is the next trick. Um, I put down our sort of tweaks that we've done. Uh, so we, 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 we run a, a, a 12 gig uh, heap, which is you know, as high as we could, we could push it. Uh, the the Eden, Eden space is, is 1.6 gigs. The survivor ratio we actually shrunk because you know, we didn't really have this uh, promotion problem. Uh, so it gives us a little more room for heap. Uh, we use co uh, compressed oops, which means if your heap is less than uh, 32 gigs, uh, it doesn't have to use a long for each uh, pointer. Uh, and then this other thing, which uh, we actually just opened a Cassandra ticket on, there's, there's this feature which should be default uh, if you use the server flag, but it's not. But this actually gives us like a 15% uh, boost on, on, on reads uh, just by adding this uh, T-Lab. Uh, what it is is the uh, th th thread local allocation. Uh, so so in, in Java, when you're creating new objects, if you don't have this turned on, then it basically uh, uses one sort of uh, shared uh, system to basically a allocate new things uh, onto the heap. Uh, 
but, uh, but with this turned on, it's done per thread, so you get a lot uh, more uh, th throughput. Uh, things don't get bogged down and locked. <clears throat> so configuration changes. Uh, this is like all very detail oriented. I wanted to, we wanted to kind of go through and, and tell like all the little things that we've, we've set, because I think it'd be pretty useful for everyone. Uh, the the hand to handoff we uh, set to a, a single thread versus the default of two with a 100 kilobyte throttle. Um, this is sort of just to help us figure out, um, you know, when, when it ran with multiple threads uh, and a larger uh, uh, th throttle limit, uh, basically there was too much uh, c c CPU being spent and we couldn't really uh, keep up with, with, with uh, reads and writes. Uh, the mem table size we set to 2048. This is for a 12 gig heap, so it leaves enough uh, room for the mem tables. Uh, and we really wanted to focus, which we really tried to, even though Cassandra is well known for a, a, a write uh, heavy system where writes work really well. It, it is really good for reads. You just have to, you know, be very careful and and, and tune things. And the Cassandra uh, 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 community, we're, we're really focused on trying to make this uh, like a top priority. We want it to be as fast as possible to reads, just as fast as writes. Uh, on the server side, for the thrift service, we use the half sync, half async. Um, since we have this giant uh, compute cluster come in and, and hit these nodes like crazy, they kind of hit it and then stay open. So if you have like one thread per request, obviously that's, that's not gonna scale. Uh, the compaction we've set to four threads for, uh, for multi-threaded compaction. This is a good balance because we have 16 cores currently and uh, you know, it, it leaves uh, f four cores for compactions and the rest are available to do uh, reads and writes. Uh, and uh, we turned off the, uh, the, the internode compression, which is new, uh, because it was causing too, uh, too, too much GC, because basically on each message it, it gets uh, off of the wire, it uh, basically has to decompress into a, uh, a, 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 a buffer, uh, and, and since we were running uh, on a uh, 10 gig network, like what's the point of having compression? Uh, it's, everything's gonna be uh, fast, at least we haven't hit any any limits yet. So this is the point of the talk that Jonathan referred to earlier this morning was um, we have this problem with uh, compaction. But I want to start just by discussing level compaction. I don't know how many of you guys are, are aware of leveled and how it works. There's been a bunch of uh, blog posts about it and talks about it. But um, basically what you can, what it allows you to do is sort of limit um, the number of, of, of SS tables that your data lives in. Um, so the default compaction is called size tiered, and what it does is every time Cassandra flushes out uh, a mem table to disk, um, those kind of build up. And what size tier does is it takes a random set of, of SS tables of a similar size, and it compacts them together into a larger one. And then once there's four or you know a certain number of those, it takes those and it compacts them together into another one. Uh, so that's great. It's like it's nice and simple. It's efficient, uh, and, and it multi-threads really well. Uh, the problem is that, um, you know, for wide rows, which is our use case, as you saw earlier in the data model, we end up with this problem where we have our, our row, everything is split out um, into these, you know, huge wide rows. So over time, you're going to get your data into more and more uh, SS tables. And that was, wasn't really something that, that worked well for us. Uh, so, so level compaction makes sense because what it does is it puts a lower bound on, on the number of SS tables that you have to read from. Uh, so this picture shows um, in, in level DB, uh, in, in level compaction comes from level DB, which comes from Google, um, and they uh, describe it in this you know giant comment, uh, and you know it's sort of uh, been adopted by a bunch of systems uh, to kind of uh, uh, to be used. But what it does is it um, it, it takes it creates uh, a, a certain number of levels. Um, and for each one, is, uh, each level is 10 times the size of, of the previous level. And what you do is you fix the size of, of your SS tables for each level, right? So, uh, so each SS table is gonna be, uh, I think the default is five megabytes. We set it to like 64 megabytes. And what it allows you to do is, um, so in, in level zero, there'll be 10 SS tables. And in, in, oh, sorry, not level zero. In level one, there'll be uh, 10 SS tables. In level two, there'll be 100. In level three, there'll be 1,000 and so on. And, and what it allows you to do is, um, is, is you don't, it's not randomly ordered each level. The, the, uh, each level is, is, is sorted by, by row key. So you can actually just uh, ask the, the leveled 
um, manifest, you can say, hey, um, uh, which SS tables does this row belong to? And it'll say these you know, N uh, uh, SS tables should have this row, and then you go check it. So versus size tiered, which is kind of this like exponential, it, it keeps growing and growing and growing over time, and there's been talks, you know, people in the past have had like SS tables of like 300 gigs or something like that. Um, uh, so in order to work around it, you can use this, and it allows you to kind of, um, it's a good workaround for wide rows. Uh, so it allows you to, and it allows us to handle our use case, which is sometimes we want just a particular point, and sometimes we want a, a, a time slice. Uh, now, the problem with level compaction, and you can see it in here, the, the yellow, you can see in level one through five, we only have to check a couple. But level zero, which is sort of the raw um, flushed SS tables, uh, you always have to check all of them. And what ends up happening is it, it's like breaking bad. You know, it, you get this uh, under high write load, you can't keep up with the compactions in, in leveled. Uh, so you end up having this like uh, gigantic effect of you keep writing out these SS tables, the compaction can't keep up. So you end up having more and more and more of these SS tables. It almost defeats the purpose of, of leveled because, uh, you know, you want to have, the, the point of it is you're trying to limit the number of SS tables. But in this scenario, you have to check, you know, a huge amount every time. So what ends up happening in a high read, high, high read and high write, which is, is what we have, is uh, you know, your, your, your reads go way, way, way down. Uh, so what we decided to do was, um, and it's, it's pretty conceptually simple, is we combine the two uh, compaction strategies so that for, um, for level zero, we, we use size tiered. Um, so as long as it's in level zero, uh, basically the, 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 uh, the, high, the, the level compaction hasn't picked it up yet. Uh, so it's just sort of there. Um, we, know, we know all the SS tables are relatively small because they were just flushed. So we can size tier them together. It's really not a huge uh, burden on the system. Uh, and we end up cutting down on the number of SS tables that we have to read from in level zero. And in the meantime, you know, once it does get to one of those larger SS tables, it actually goes faster because the SS tables are now much larger. And in order to get into level zero, it picks like a random 32. Uh, SS tables from, uh, for, sorry, in order to get into level one, the, the compaction strategy picks a random 32 level zeros. Uh, so if those are all larger, they end up getting more throughput into the system anyway. Uh, so that, that was the compaction stuff. Now, uh, this other issue that we had was uh, compression. Um, a, a lot of the CPU time is spent on compression. You know, with, with SSDs, you really want to get um, you know, the most bang, bang for your buck. Uh, so we wanted to kind of keep as much in, uh, it, uh, c compressed as possible, but it's very CPU intensive because you keep rereading the same uh, 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 block over, compressed block over and over, e even if it's in the page cache. Uh, so there's a faster compression that came out you know, relatively soon after uh, Snappy, which is called LZ4. And, and in benchmarks, it's, it's you know, 40% uh, faster than Snappy. Uh, and there's a guy who works in uh, Solar who wrote a, a Java implementation of it. It's really nice. It has um, basically a pure Java implementation. It has a Java unsafe, which is this magic API that you're not supposed to know about, but everyone uses. Um, and there's also just a pure C version. Uh, so, uh, and you can see in this benchmark, Snappy is over on the left, and uh, uh, the, the unsafe one, which doesn't require any native hooks, um, runs at the same speed of Snappy, so that's a huge win right there, because then you can run on a lot more uh, platforms. Uh, and at the same time, uh, uh, the, the, the JNI is, is faster. We didn't see this in, in practice, uh, because the, the blocks that Cassandra compresses are, are so small. Um, and so much time is spent uh, go going back and forth through uh, JNI, uh, but it did cut down on, on, on the 95th percentile latency. So, like the overall throughput stayed the same, uh, but but our, but our latency dropped a bit. Uh, so that's good. Uh, and finally, uh, the CRC check is another huge area that uh, it spends a lot of time in. Uh, so a lot of time is spent when you're profiling and you're looking at this. Uh, the, the CRC check for each compressed block. Um, it, it currently uses like a, just a pure uh, Java uh, uh, method, which is really slow. So it ends up taking, uh, you know, two, two, uh, it ends up causing a, a, a 2x performance hit when, when you do this CRC check. There's a last chance, uh, there's a percentage chance 
that you can set per column family. You could say, I only want to read uh, every 10% of the blocks do the CRC check. Uh, now, uh, in Hadoop, they actually created, uh, they did this benchmark, and they found that a pure JNI version of the CRC check runs uh, 30x faster than the Java version. So it might make sense to, uh, to, to move that into JNI. Um, and I wanted to throw up, these are our current stats. We, have, we currently have 12 nodes in two data centers. We're running at RF6, which means we have six copies, so it's, it's kind of wasteful, but it gives us a guarantee that we can either lose a data center or, or we can lose a node in each data center. Uh, we can do 150,000 writes per second for our data size. Uh, we can also do 100,000 reads per second uh, for, 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 for the cross-section queries. Uh, we have over six billion points without compression, and the uncompressed, is, it's about two terabytes. And our latencies are down there below. Those are actually uh, our, our, our Olympus-level latencies. Um, so those aren't actually even Cassandra. That's like after it goes out of Cassandra. Uh, and then through our service. Uh, and that's it. I don't know. I probably blew through that, didn't I? No. All right, we got 15 minutes. All right. So I want to open up to questions, uh, or if you want to go back over anything you didn't understand, or anything else. Patch. Yeah, so the patch for the hybrid compaction, uh, that's, I mean, the only, the only thing is it's not, you know, pretty enough because uh, it, it assumes, like, so our, our SS table, our, our, uh, our, our leveled compaction is set to like a 64 megabyte uh, thing. So it actually looks for like a fixed number of megabytes available to do the size sharing. So we just need to make it generic, but in a, a week. Later. Later. <laughs> <laughs> The question was, can you reiterate what kind of filtering Olympus was doing? Yeah, sure. So it does the, um, let's see if I can go back that far. Let's see if I knew which page it was on. Uh, so it does uh, the filtering down by time series. So when someone asks a time series query, they're asking for, they have a, the start and the end, and then they have the periodicity. So if we're providing one minute, the last value that we have for that minute, the Olympus will take the raw results that Cassandra has, which is every single data point, so microsecond level data points, and it'll then take that and it'll roll it up into a single data point for that minute. And then it also does the knowledge time filtering. So we can go back and, and update a value many times, but we really only care about the last value. So that's what the, the Olympus does both of those, uh, those components. The user can specify what, what interval. Yeah. Right. And the main idea is that you know, uh, uh, all the writes come, come, come through the service layer and they go out through the service layer. So we can, so we can down sample that data as it comes in. So based on the query, we figure out which, which one to talk to. And then, but within that, you might ask for like every third day on Tuesday, uh, that happens to be a Tuesday at the end of a month. Right, so you, you can't plan for all of those downsamplings. Right. Right, exactly. Is, is that it's kept in memory right now. Okay. One of your last slides you mentioned, and it works in Java 7, and not to open that can of worms, but can I open that can of worms? Yes. Uh, well, I mean, so yeah. W one of the other motivations for the LZ4 is um, so the snappy uh, implementation that we use uh, in Cassandra doesn't uh, work in Java 7. Um, it, it may end up getting fixed, but um, in the meantime, it's it's sort of this a uh, hard barrier for getting into it, uh, in, for making Cassandra go to Java 7. I think, Jonathan, you probably mentioned that I think like Java 7 is going to be like the de facto 
Uh, I mean, it already works in Java 7, but one of the barriers is, you know, all, all the SS tables have, uh, all the column families have compression turned on by default using Snappy. Now that this is in, uh, th th this was committed, um, and the new default is gonna be this LZ4, which works with Java 7. So if, you, if you're upgrading from Java 6 to Java 7, you have to um, re uh, recompact all, all, all uh, your, your data with the new compression scheme, um, and then everything will, will work great in Java 7. We just ran into so many problems that ended up being Java 7 related that, I mean, I've been sort of ba banned from using Java 7. Well, how, how long ago? Uh, over the last, say, three or four months. Really? Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, I'd be interested to hear. I mean, we are sort of in testing with it. Um, uh, but we haven't hit any 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 major roadblocks, and I know there are people out there that are using Cassandra with Java Seven, and don't have issues. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's not something that we support right now, but it is Just something that. Oh, uh, so. Uh, Moving averages, can that be calculated in Olympus? Um, so it's something that we're, we will um, add, and it's something, again, where it's going through all of this data that we have and providing the, the filter in the service. But the point is, if it uses Olympus as the place it gets done. Right, yeah, it, Cassandra doesn't, doesn't do the, the roll-ups. Are you loading uh, all of your market data in real time uh, incrementally throughout the day, or are you um, doing some sort of like bulk load operation if you get a, uh, a vendor feed of that data? Uh, yeah, so right now we're, we have um, basically very discrete points that we actually capture market data at, and we, we are recording that real time. Um, in the future, we expect to grow the the cluster size so that we can handle real time market data coming in. Yes, so that's what we've, that, those are the points that we went through um, on like Java tuning and, and tuning Cassandra. It's because when you read and write, the performance hurts because you're doing like in-memory operations and you have to do locks. Um, I mean, that, not locks, but uh, you have to, you're reading stuff that could be write, being written by another, uh, another client. Um, so there's, that's mainly the reason that we've been doing all this tuning to the JVM and to Cassandra to handle that, that load. Right, and, and one of the things to notice is that we're actually doing a qu quorum level reads and writes, uh, so, so we do want consistency uh, through it. So it's not like we're getting uh, random, uh, randomly consistent data. case of an interruption, oh sorry, in case of uh, interruption in, uh, or, or error in the data stream, what, what means would you have to uh, update the data and, and uh, have it addressed properly upstream? Right, I mean, if you go back to the earlier slide, this is this, is this whole bitemporal uh, time series. There's actually two dimensions, right? So we never actually update points um, uh, in place. We, we create a new point with, with a later knowledge time. Um, so what that allows us to do is say like, uh, because what you want is to be able to go back in time and say, uh, when, when something happened uh, yesterday, when we had the bad data, this happened. So we want to simulate that, or you know, we also want to have the ability to fix it. So having a second dimension of time is, is what g uh, gives you that. So let's, or, was it in here? So that's, that's why there's two ticks. There's the as of, which is, uh, when it happens, and then there's the knowledge time, which is when did we learn about it. What are some of your current performance challenges that you guys are facing right now that you're 
trying to work around or work out, especially as you're starting to kind of scale out a little bit more? You want to take that one? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we just have, uh, we, we have our consumers are much, 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 much larger and greedier than our Cassandra cluster. <laughs> so what we try to do is um, we're trying to optimize, like, so we have functional, the functional use case works, right? Like, it does what it's supposed to do, but it doesn't always do it the best way. Obviously, you see, you know, we can be really, really, uh, do really, really silly things, like pull down 200,000 points and send back 300. Really bad idea, but you know. So the idea is we could we can prefetch that data and cache it because we know it's coming uh, and we know everyone wants that uh, one data point or something like that. So we're trying to be smart about when we pull the data. But I think the longer term goal is you know uh, you know uh, the fact that Cassandra is open source. Um, you know we're we're we're, uh, we're we're a strong development shop. So you know we really want to uh, make sure that Cassandra has these functionalities and you know we we're. We're working with the Cassandra committers um, and everyone else to try to make sure that you know the idea of like being able to push down a filter into Cassandra is something that everyone could probably use. Um, you know, because CQL will cover some cases, but you sometimes want to filter a result set. Like so, based on this result, then do this, and that's really what um, what what we're going to eventually end up doing. Another one over there. Have you ever needed to roll off some data? Because it seems like you're taking a lot of data points per company, and I, th I think there's a, like a two billion uh, column limit for how many data points you can store per, per row. So have you ever had to do that? No, I, we, we don't have that uh, level of data yet. Um, so we, we haven't hit any of those uh, uh, limits yet. But I mean, our, our plan is uh, we're basically going to segment uh, over time, like a like a SS table per year or per month or whatever. I mean, a column family per year per month. I think we're out of time. Almost, yeah. No. Oh, well. Wow. <laughs> stand here uh, awkwardly. Yeah. <laughs> five minutes. Oh, five minutes. Okay. I, I want to. There was something I wanted to go over. I had a funny joke, actually. <laughs> yeah. If I can remember it on the spot, I can't remember what it was. Oh, that's the you want the wrong way. Oh, I went the wrong way. As I'm going through, I'm like, what was that joke again? <laughs> I thought of it when I wrote the slide, and I. Oh, here's another question. Good. <laughs> We're all saved. Would you give us more insight of how you find the last known value in your time series for a given uh, ticker or company? Yeah, that's, uh, it's basically done um, using the less than operator in, in CQL. And so we just look at the, the knowledge time. Um, so that, that's stored in, uh, in order. And we, we have ordered by the as of and the knowledge time. So it's going to be the first record that, that we get back. So um, I'm just going back to the data model there. Yeah. So, so we actually store the very last point that's, that's been written is the first value in the, the column. Right. So see uh, the clustering ordered by uh, the, the, uh, and descending. That means the first point is the most recent. Right, you have to go through the as of time. Yeah, we, for most of our queries, we know what the as of time that we're looking for is, and then we do the right. knowledge. And we don't have that many knowledge times per point. So uh, I was kind of curious about the uh, hybrid compaction strategy. If you take one of those really super huge SS tables from level zero and push it up to level one because of the size limit of SS tables in leveled compaction, I guess you would like take that one SS table and suddenly there are like uh, 150 or whatever in level one. Um, does the 
leveled compaction? Is, is it able to handle that? Oh, we're actually not just one or two or three uh, SS tables uh, over what we're supposed to. We, we're, we're like right. at double our nominal capacity. Right. Are I mean, if, if, if it doesn't fit in, in level uh, one, then it'll, it'll promote it to level four or something like that. So it'll push everything else, else out. Well, and, and we, stop, uh, we stop the size tier once it hits the limit of leveled. So we would only do size tiered up to, so we have 64 megabyte uh, SS tables in leveled. So we only do size tiered until it's 64, and then it's ready for promotion. Well, yeah. OK, thank you. No, there is no or so 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 this is at um, uh, at uh, at DML time, right? So so this is like the setup for the column family. So this isn't a query. This is it's stored in that order. So it's that's. But yeah, if you had to like somehow read it in some other order, it would it would be um, very expensive. Another question: um, What about uh, stock splits, which change the price? Is that handled in this somehow? No. Yeah, I mean, basically. Uh, so these are actual, just actual price. So you would have to know. You would, you would basically, after an event like that, the time series doesn't work back. So the, the, you would get a new, um, instead of like Apple, you would get like Apple II, something like that. And so if you wanted to go back, you would have to find all of the entities that contributed to the stock split, or like it, it's basically just Apple, and then it did a stock split, and then it became Apple too. Well, I mean, do you do a sep create a separate row, or yes. do you? Okay, okay, so you do that, and I would have to know uh, which row to go to uh, based it on would the be, split. It, it's basically, as of some time, it it's becomes a new, a new entity. Okay, thanks. Yeah, we did. Um, the, the problem is, uh, oh, uh, sorry, do we do a comparison against other uh, tech level databases? So the, the problem with a lot of them is it doesn't answer the other query, which is the cross section. So it does, it's optimized for the time series, but not the cross section. And we, we need to be able to do both. Okay, well, thank you. <laughs>